in our study, we've, um, we've seen certain patterns emerge, as I said before, cycles, we call them, where um, we see a series of events that continue to repeat themselves in order to drive home a point. John is you know, steady on this point. He never, he never goes to the left or to the right. It's always about pointing to Jesus um, as the God-man. So the most prevalent cycle in John is that which sees you know, Jesus declaring His divinity, either by some teaching or by a miracle, and then His hearers either believing or disbelieving His claims. Um, now these, um, there were several uh, objectives that the repetition of this cycle seemed to, uh, seemed to aim for. First of all, to make clear Jesus' claims and actions. You, know, you, you may or may not believe it, but there is no doubt that Jesus taught and demonstrated through His power that He was the Son of God. You, you don't have to believe it. If you read the, the New Testament, if you read John, um, you could say, you know, I know he's saying that, but I don't believe it. Well, okay, you're, you have a right to say I don't believe it, but you can't say that's not what he's doing. You know, people can choose to disbelieve and reject this notion, but Jesus' message is clear. He believed and he wanted us to believe that he was divine and he was and is, of course, the Messiah. Another objective was to um, uh, provide, uh, provide proof for the claims that he made. So John records several miracles in detail in order to support the claims of Jesus. Now some may not have believed, but he writes as one who believed strongly the proof before him. I mean, John himself, obviously, he was a believer. And then another objective was to record the reactions of the people. That the disbelief among the Jews was widespread, not just a fluke, or not just a kind of a narrow opinion. John describes the familiar scene of Jesus demonstrating great power, and then the Jewish leaders and eventually the crowds that celebrated Him turned against Him in disbelief and in anger. So you know, uh, 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 this scene is repeated over and over again to reinforce the idea that some believed, but most disbelieved. So you know, historically, some will say, well, only a few Jews actually disbelieved. That's, that, that would be incorrect according to John and John's eyewitness. As far as John is concerned, the majority of the people um, disbelieved, and the line of demarcation would always be you know, who is Jesus? As a matter of fact, you know, with a, when you're having a Bible study and you don't know where to start with someone, uh, a lot of times we start with the baptism, for example, but I think that's not really a good place to start. A good place to start is with the question, who do you believe that Jesus is? You'd be amazed, I mean, uh, the different opinions that people, that people have about that. So if you're about to have a study with someone that's, and you don't know where to start, start there. Ask them who they believe Jesus is, and according to that answer, you'll know, you know what to teach and what to begin. And so this brings us to our um, uh, last lesson, I mean, the previous lesson, where I compared the reaction of various people to Lazarus' death and resurrection, now made possible, of course, by God through Christ. And in that lesson, I showed you how different people had their faith strengthened by this great miracle, and how others, like Judas and the religious leaders, hardened their hearts in disbelief, and this, of course, repeated that same cycle we've been talking about of faith and disbelief. All right, so today, uh, in our lesson, John begins the narrative that will describe the final hours of Jesus' ministry here on earth, and how people reacted to Him again as He went through His passion, how people reacted to Him again with faith or disbelief. All right, so we need to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Passover meal because that's where we're at. Rather, that's where John is at in his, uh, in his narrative. Each year the Jews celebrated the feast of the Passover which commemorated the liberation of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, I think we know that. The feast focused on the final powerful sign that God used in freeing them. Uh, 
Um, uh, and if we read in the Old Testament, we read that he sent an angel to destroy every firstborn in Egypt, both human and animal. And he instructed the Jews who were kept in captivity in Egypt, he instructed them to kill a lamb and sprinkle their doorposts with, uh, with its blood. Uh, and then cook and eat the animal uh, while indoors that particular night. So when the Egyptians awake to the death of all their firstborn the next day, even the Pharaoh's child was taken, the Jews were then set free. The Pharaoh finally allowed them to leave. So the Lord commanded them to keep a remembrance of this time by having the Passover meal each year. And there was a set order for this particular, uh, for this particular meal. For example, as they celebrated it you know, afterwards, uh, a lamb was sacrificed at the temple or on behalf of a family, or sometimes groups of people would send uh, a sacrifice to be offered. Uh, the meat was then prepared along with unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and wine for the meal. Uh, each element had its own significance. For example, the lamb was the sacrifice that was offered in place of the firstborn. You see, the idea is the Egyptians had no sacrifice to offer, so the firstborn of each family and each, each uh, you know, and their animals was taken. But the uh, Israelites, they had a sacrifice. They had offered a lamb as sacrifice. And so, uh, in, a, in essence, God accepted that sacrifice instead of their firstborn. So the lamb, of course, that they ate was a representative of that sacrifice. The bitter herbs, uh, like a salad, it was like a salad, really represented the harsh experience that they had as slaves. The unleavened bread, of course, signified the haste with which they left Egypt. The idea that they had no time to make bread and, and let the yeast work so the bread could rise. They had to eat unleavened bread because they were in a hurry. And then the wine, of course, they didn't have that. You know, in Genesis, they don't talk about that. Uh, the wine was added much later, but it came to represent the new and the abundant land that God had eventually brought them to, you know, the land of milk and honey and you know, abundance. Well, the wine that they had at the uh, Passover meal afterwards uh, was representative of that new life. So according to the law, the Passover lasted seven days and the meal was prepared and it was eaten on the evening prior to the Passover day. So this would be uh, Thursday evening. During the week, the Jews would make sure that no yeast or fermenting agent would be present in their homes or in their food. Uh, of course, for them, yeast was a symbol of decay and so it was eliminated totally during this time. The bread was without yeast or leaven. The wine was mixed with water, as was their custom. During the meal, the father, and if the father wasn't there, there would be one who was presiding, the presider, if there was no father present, uh, would direct the proceeding. It wasn't just, you know, all right, everybody dig in. You know, it wasn't that kind of a meal. There was a process to the meal because it was a symbolic meal that they were eating. So the, the father or the presider would first eat and then the others would follow. Um, he would offer a blessing as they shared a cup of the wine. And then when everything would finish, uh, they would stand and they would sing the Hallel, which are psalms of praise, uh, psalms of several psalms of David. And so it was this meal that Jesus gathered with his apostles to share, while John would, uh, that John describes in chapter 13. Another feature of the meal also, the instructive part of the meal, was then uh, a young person would ask, the presider would ask the father, you know, what is this meal about? and that would give occasion uh, for teaching concerning the Exodus, concerning their religion and their history. So this is the meal that Jesus was sharing with his apostles. Now John doesn't provide any details concerning the Lord's Supper, interestingly enough. I mean, this has already been done adequately in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also in 1 Corinthians by Paul. John does, however, provide a lot of detail as to what was said and done that night that the others in their gospels don't give us. So it's really interesting uh, to read John because you get all the little goings on at that particular meal. Now his description of that evening in the upper room will go on from chapter 13 all the way to the end of chapter 17. He spends a lot of time describing what happened that night. 
Now most of the information includes a long prayer and teaching section by Jesus to His apostles on His final night with them before His, before his death. But before He begins this prayer, however, He's going to do two important things for His apostles. First thing He's going to do is He's going to wash their feet. And so we read chapter 13, we're at the beginning, verses one to five. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that His hour had come, that He would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was uh, girded. So of course Jesus was fully aware of who he was, why he was sent, that his time was near, and that you know, what kind of men his apostles were, he knew who he was dealing with. And knowing and accepting all of this, he still loved them and accepted what he was sent to do on their behalf because you know, their lack of faith and their hard-heartedness at times you know, he's thinking, boy, I'm doing all of this for these guys? <laughs> and if it was just a human being, I don't know if somebody would go out, you know, to that length of sacrifice for these men. But the Bible says that Jesus knew who they were. He understood their weaknesses, and yet he was still willing to do what he did. So even knowing that one of his apostles would betray him, even with that knowledge, he loved them nevertheless, and he humbled himself to do the thing that he was about to do. Now, in those days, a little bit of social background here, in those days the host would set a jar of water, a bowl and a towel near the doorway for the purpose of washing the guest's feet. Uh, it was their version of a doormat. They didn't have doormats in those days. Usually the task was given to a slave, not any slave, usually the youngest slave or the youngest boy in the family. It was that low on the totem pole. Uh, since they had borrowed the upper room, however, and it was a private meal, no one had been assigned to take care of the detail of washing the feet. So imagine now, human nature, okay? The apostles coming in with dusty and dirty feet, no one to greet them, no one you know, assigned to wash the feet, which was just a normal custom. Imagine as each man, each apostle arrived, no one offering to do the courteous thing for the other because it would be way too demeaning. Wash his feet, come on, that's for kids, that's for slaves. Imagine their chagrin when the Lord Himself gets up from the dinner table and quietly begins to do the honors, the work of a slave, the task belonging to the one with the least position, the least honor, the least you know, maturity. So the other writers you know, describe an argument among the apostles concerning who was the greatest because they probably didn't like the seating arrangement. Jesus silences them with this action. So imagine they come in, nobody bothers to wash anybody's feet, they sit down and they notice the seating arrangement and this discussion about who's the greatest and who should be first and so on and so forth be begins. And in order, instead of saying, hey guys, settle down here, we're having a Passover, stop arguing without a single word while they're arguing about who's the greatest, Jesus gets up without a word, he goes and gets the bowl, he ties the towel around himself, he puts the bowl and he starts washing their feet. Can you imagine how you would feel if that was happening uh, to you? All right, so let's read verse six to, uh, verses six to 11, shall we? It says, so he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but, it is, uh, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Of course, you know, Peter breaks the awkward silence with a show of protest. He doesn't understand all the implications of this action and what Jesus will say about it later and what it will mean. Of course, the implication hereafter is that they will realize that the Son of God actually washed their feet. The highest took the absolute lowest position. That's what's going to strike them later on. So Jesus, you know, uh, uh, Jesus kind of presses him by saying that without this, Peter cannot remain a part of Jesus. So Peter reverses himself, he goes to the other extreme, that's what he is, he's an extremist, he's compulsive. So he says, well if washing my feet unites me to you, then wash me all over in order you know, to make sure. And Jesus reassures him that only this is necessary for now, and those who have a clean heart, meaning they sincerely believe and act from faith, are completely clean, they're completely absolved, and have no need for further purification. Then he makes reference to the fact that there's a traitor among them. You know, one who has received the foot washing, but whose heart is unclean. Imagine again the emotions going through these guys. You know, once he's done this, you feel ashamed of yourself for not having done the right thing. And then on top of that he says, oh and by the way, one of you is a traitor. And so let's read that part beginning in verse 12. It says, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the, ta at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If, then, if I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Of course, Later on, they're going to feel the impact of this gesture, you know, that God humbled Himself before them. For now, He uses the foot washing as an example upon which they should base their attitude towards one another. What a graphic example that is. You know, if, if the master can wash your feet, certainly you can do it for each other. If God can lower Himself to do this thing, why can't you lower yourself to serve your brother or your sister? So today, of course, we have doormats. But the need to humble ourselves before one another is still the basic way that we avoid strife and division caused by pride and you know, help uh, maintain the unity that we have in Christ. So let's keep reading uh, John's description of that evening. He says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So here Jesus reveals to them not only that he will be betrayed by one of them, but that the betrayal was prophesied long ago. He's Actually, you know, he who lifts his heel against me, that's Psalm chapter 41, verse nine. So he's saying, I know one of you will betray me. I know I will be betrayed. And this betrayal was prophesied long ago. And here's the passage that refers to it. In addition to this, he tells them that this will be another indicator of his divine nature, the ability to predict, predict the future accurately. So once again, He's demonstrating, remember the cycle, He's demonstrating His divinity. So at this point, the Lord you know, does the second important thing for His apostles. The first thing He did, important, He washed their feet, and we've kind of talked about the impact of that. The second thing, He reveals the traitor among them, verses 21 to 30. So until now, the apostles have not really grasped what Jesus has been saying to them. 
In the following verses, the Lord not only makes it plain to the apostles, but He also reveals to Judas that He knows what Judas is planning to do. Wow. He predicts it, he knows it, he tells them that this, this thing that's going to happen was prophesied, and he points to the guy who's actually going to do it. So I want you to imagine the um, scene. Let's read uh, verse 21 here. It says, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at, at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining, there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him, to that disciple, and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had, uh, so when he had dipped the morsel, meaning the bread you know, in, the, in the wine, uh, or in the bitter herbs actually, uh, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him, therefore Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now, no one of those reclining at table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately and it was night. So you need to imagine the scene here, okay? Thirteen men reclining on cushions around a table like a squared off U, if you wish. You know that famous painting, the, was it Da Vinci? You know, Jesus is in the, sitting at a table on a chair in the middle and all the apostles next to him. That's you know, historically incorrect. They didn't, they didn't sit at tables like that. They, sat on the floor on cushions, reclining, and uh, at a table like, uh, like this. So the way it worked is that the host or the organizer of the dinner sat at the head of the table, and the head of the table was at one extreme end there, where you see, where it says John, okay? So he could protect and serve the honored guest or the presider. The honored guest would then sit next to him and then the guest would assign seats around the table, usually in order of status. The oldest to the youngest, perhaps the most important, or whatever, if, if there was rank, so on and so forth. Now, remember, let's go back. There was complaining among the apostles about who was important. Remember, that was their discussion when they came in and sat down. It seems that John and Peter organized the dinner. We know that from Luke chapter 21. Jesus said to Peter and John go, you know, prepare the room, prepare the upper room, okay? And it seems that they had hoped to take the coveted spots next to Jesus. So John, as the host, in the very first seat, with Jesus to his left as the guest of honor, followed, of course, by Peter, the leader, and then the other apostles you know, doing the best they could. Probably Judas would be sat last at the other end since they knew that he was a thief and he was untrustworthy. Well, things you know, started as planned with John taking the first spot. We know this because he leaned his head on Jesus, so he had to be next to him. Jesus, of course, in the honored position, which no one contested. But then John tells us three important facts. Number one, when washing their feet, he came to Peter last. And then when speaking to John, Peter had to gesture to get his attention. And then Jesus spoke and handed the morsel directly to Judas. So therefore Judas couldn't be sitting at the other end because Jesus handed him the morsel. You know, he was within range. This means that Judas was next to the Lord and Peter sat at the end of the table. Perhaps when assigning seats, Jesus placed Judas next to him because he knew what was to come. And Peter, I mean knowing his character, in a fit of peak, pouting, you know, went to sit as far away as he could. This certainly explains his behavior when Jesus came to him with the water and the towel to wash his feet. 
Now much of the evidence points to this scenario. In any case, Jesus forces Judas' hand without any of the others knowing what had taken place. He's, he's talking right next to him. The idea that Satan entered him is not to suggest that Judas was demon-possessed. Some people talk about that. And you know, he was demon-possessed, so he wasn't responsible for his action. This reference indicates when Judas finally gave in fully to the temptation. When you give fully into the temptation, then Jesus is no longer the one animating you, directing you. Satan is the one directing you. He's the one that's taking care of you. So Judas was no longer under the influence of Christ. He had completely given himself over to the sin that he was about to commit. Therefore, Satan was now controlling him. And of course, as a way of saying this, you know, uh, 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 Jesus or John says, you know, Satan entered him. The idea of now, now Satan is in control. He's, he's driving the show as far as, um, as, far as uh, Judas is concerned. Well, we're going to kind of stop right here because the next section begins Jesus' last prayer and exhortation for His apostles before He's killed. And it's a kind of a long section, so I'd like to start it at the beginning. Okay? Now, even though the Lord's Supper is not described here, this passage does provide lessons that are usually found in those passages where the Lord's Supper is found. For example, one lesson, you're wondering, huh, seating arrangement, so on, and so on. what lesson can be drawn? Well, one, uh, one lesson that we can draw is a servant is really not above his master, really. I mean, if we choose to follow Christ, we have to follow Him in all of His ways, not just some. So if He was willing to wash feet before the communion, so must we, and I'm not talking about before the Lord's Supper, we have to go around washing people's feet. In other words, if He was willing to humble Himself, so should we. Otherwise, we don't belong at the table. You know, when Peter, when, uh, uh, not Peter, but uh, Paul is talking in 1 Corinthians that we need to examine ourselves, what do you think he's, he means? Examine yourself before you take the communion. Are you in the spirit of Christ? ready to take that communion? Do you, do, you know, do you have a grudge against somebody? You mad at somebody? You know, before you take the communion, it might be a good thing to humble yourself and make the decision, you know what, I'm going to make that situation right. So that's, you know, a servant is not above his master. You know, Jesus didn't have to repent of sin, obviously, he had no sin, but to humble himself, remember he was a man, fully man, and as a man, the Lord and the teacher of those 12 guys, to humble himself, to wash their feet, especially the guy who was going to betray him, took quite an act of humility. So he's saying, hey, if I did it, and I didn't have to do it, certainly you can do it, because you're, you know, you're, neither are you Lord and neither are you guys master or, or teachers. And then another lesson that's there, very you know, driven home, is that a servant should examine himself or herself, as I was saying. If Judas would have examined his heart full of disbelief and greed, he might not have fallen into the total control of Satan. He could have whispered to Jesus, he was right next to him, Lord help me. He could have whispered, no one else would have known. Lord, help me. I think in my own prayers, if I, if I were to try to you know, uh, highlight the words I use the most in my, in my prayer life, and you know, like they do sometimes, there's a computer program that'll show you which words you use the most often in letters and so on and so forth. The two words that I use the most are help and thanks. Help and thanks. If Judas, if Judas would have just said, Lord, help me. I, I'm, I'm not where I need to be. Ah, I know the others believe, but my faith is weak. Help me. You think Jesus would have you know, <laughs> refused that? You know, when the Lord hands us the communion bread, Let's make sure it's not an accusation of infidelity and hypocrisy like the morsel that he handed to Judas. You know, he takes the bread, 
it's the Passover and he hands it to Judas. Is it, is it the bread that he's taking for the Passover meal or is it the bread of infidelity? Is it the bread of accusation? So, you know, let's be sure uh, that our hearts are right before we sit to eat with the Lord at communion time and we're not sitting in Judas' seat. We don't want to sit in his seat. He was in a position of honor next to the Lord. So before the other apostles, that's what probably they were complaining about. What's this guy doing next to the Lord? You know, I'm a, surely I'm better than that guy. He's a thief. Doesn't the Lord know this guy's a thief? Does, have we not said that sometimes about other people? Lord, look, this person here, how, how come they're getting away with it? And you know, all I get is you know, trouble and grief. Yeah. So Jesus knows our heart. And so there's no use being uh, mm, deceptive with him or coy or trying to hide stuff. You know? The best way, I, I always say that the best strategy with the Lord, throw yourself at his mercy. <laughs> That's the number one strategy for me. I just throw myself at his mercy because I can count on his mercy. If I try to justify myself, uh-oh, there may be problems there. All right, so that's you know, we, we've brought it to the end of the foot washing incident, Judas, so on and so forth. Uh, a little bit of uh, background about what happened there. Next time we're, we're going to get into the actual prayer itself. It's a long prayer, so I'd like to start fresh with that. All right, that's it for this lesson, lesson 22.